John Delacio here, and we have some very, 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 you guys are very special. You really are. We have some very, very, very special people in the room, and you watching are very special, and that makes me feel special. How about that? We got special people in the room, special people to watch, and, and Jennifer, doesn't that make you feel special? It should. That God gave us such special friends. I don't know if I'm going to make this public or for my enlisted friends. We'll see how it goes and what we said. But I wanted to uh, pray for people. I have been praying for people, and, and, and I feel like I need to expound upon this. I do not prophesy for money. It's against my belief. Now, if God tells me to sometime, I'm going to obey God. But that's not, it's, it's not the way we do things. You could say style or operate. It's just not the way we do things here at Heartland. And one of the reasons is, as an evangelistic, apostolic, prophetic, pastora, the evangelistic anointing on my life is spontaneous. Spontaneous. That's what the evangelist is, spontaneous. It means freely you receive, freely you give. I don't charge God to give me a word. <laughs> and I don't charge people to get a word because I am very zealous and jealous over the gifts of the Spirit. I have really seen them abused. I'm very jealous of it. Uh, I'm wondering if I should say this, but I've seen too many gimmicks and some phony stuff. I, I went to a prophetic ministry service and this was in 1982. Two, might have been 83 and I had a concern about what I was seeing well I saw another fellow there he was a gospel singer that I knew and a few days later we ran into each other and he said to me how did you, he said, I saw you at that uh, crusade. He said, what did you think about that? And I thought about it and I said to him, all I can say is, I don't think everything we saw was from God. I said, I cannot say no more, but that's how I feel. Well, sure enough, it came out, they were cheating. They were cheating. They were having people fill out forms, personal information. Then they would have the camera zoom in on the form. And then it would go to a person in the ministry. And the prophet had a a earring thing on. So they would zoom in on the form and the, I don't want to say who the person was who was getting the information from the camera and then they would say to the prophet, the lady in the red dress, her address is, the doctor's name is, and they would do it like they were hearing from God and they weren't. And I know two prophets that were doing that. I have to repent for having to say this. I don't even know if I should have. But I'm very zealous over the gifts of the Spirit. I had a person call. He's probably going to watch this video because he's on my texting list now. He called me up crying. I knew his mother. His mother loved me. 
His mother died. He backslid. Got involved in terrible things. He got convicted. And he called me up and telling me that he would be willing to pay me any amount of money that I would want to give him a word and get this guilt off of him. I said, you're calling the wrong preacher for that. I said, I'm going to pray for you, but you keep your money. Now, you'd think by then he would have become a partner by now, but he still hasn't gotten the message. And then another person who will probably be watching this because they're on the list now, uh, called the prayer line and said, I wonder where you're meeting. I want to put a bunch of money in your hand and I want you to give me a prayer. And I said, I'm going to pray for you if you come. I says, but I don't want you to think for one minute that you have to give me money to pray for you. It's just not who I am. Now, I know some very well-known ministers that will not prophesy to you unless you give an offering. Let me tell you whose fault that is. The people. The Christians. It really is their fault. Because the Bible says, if you read the Bible, any time they went to a prophet for a word, they brought a offering. They never went to the prophet to get a prophecy without bringing an offering. Respect. And Proverbs, it says it this way, the gift makes room for the person. They never went to church without an offering. Do you remember when the man was lame from, I guess, birth? And the apostles were coming, and he reached out to them, and he said, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Oh, no, he was, oh, no, he was asking for money. The man was lame, I think, from birth. The prophets, apostles, were coming by, and he was asking them for money. What did the apostles say to him? Silver and gold have I not, but such as I have give by thee. And they picked him up and said, walk and go get a job. Why did that man ask them that day? Because they were on their way to the synagogue. The apostles were on their way I think there was three of them walking together on their way to church. That man knew that if they were going to church, they had an offering in their pocket to give at church. The moral of the story is watch out for people who will try to get your offering before you sow it to the place you're supposed to sow it into. The point I'm trying to make is I know prophets that are now very wealthy. Multi, multi, multi millionaires. One of them will not give you a prophecy for less than a thousand dollar offering. And they have a whole bunch of them. And they have prayer. You can call and give an offering and get a prophecy. Not from them, from people they've trained. If you want a prophecy from them, it's going to be a lot more. If you went to their meeting, it would go like this. Everybody text this in your phone right now. Da, 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 da. Okay. All right. I'm hearing this number. This is the number. $100. Text it. Then when they move into ministry, they look to see who sent the hundred dollars. And if you didn't, you do not get a prophecy. I can not do that. I'm too jealous over the gifts of the Spirit. But here's why they do it. 
Because some people, the way those ministers abuse the gifts, people abuse the minister. The minister. The way some people abuse the gift, people abuse the minister. And they want a word, want a word, want a word, want a word, what a word. But they don't want to sow a seed. They want the anointing, want the anointing. They want your anointing, but they're not willing to do what it, you did to get that anointing. I can't do that. I know a church not too far from here. They have prophetic ministry. And you line up. This is the truth. And they grow. They grow. The people come in. They flock in. And they have a line. A $50 line, a $100 line, a $500 line, and a $1,000 line. And if you want a $50 prophecy, you get on that line. If you want a $1,000 prophecy, you get on that line. Where the heck is that in the Bible? I just can't do that. But I'll let me tell you what I do do. I have this thing that God gave me that I call the 10-day prayer. And many times when I go on the road and I receive the offering, the Lord said to me, 10-day prayer. But I do not tell the people before the offering. It's something that God said to me, whoever gives an offering today, tell them to put their prayer request down and I'm going to answer it within 10 days. I know that before the offering, but I do not tell the people. After the offering, before I say it or it's counted, I say, God told me to pray the 10-day prayer and I do on them and I hear many testimonies. Many. Let me tell you what else I found out. If I have been to your church to preach, I have received an offering for your church. I normally pay all my own expenses, traveling expenses there, and the staff back home. And expenses for the people on the road with me. Sometimes we had a dozen or two dozen people with us. We put gas in the vehicles, food in their belly, and paid for the recording, the editing, the production, and the airtime to promote that church. Now, a lot of times, when I, once I get there, then the church usually provides a place for me to sleep and, and for some of our staff. But we pay usual expenses. And most pastors tell me this. We don't have a an, we don't have a, an anointing for the offering like you do. Would you receive the offering for our church? I say yes. That's what I'm going to do. I love that. I love that. I love it. One person said, oh, those churches are using you. I said, good. I want God to use me. I want to bless as many churches as I can. I want to bless as many. Use me. I know that. I'm here to be used. I'm here to serve. And if that's the way I can serve your church and your ministry and your pet, I'm here to do it. But what I normally do is I receive two offerings. The first offering I always receive, and I always put the emphasis on the offering for the church. You pastors that are watching, not to be disrespectful, but I said you pastors, the pastors that are watching know that. I always receive an offering for your church first and put the emphasis on your offering. After I preach, I stop. I receive an offering for our ministry to cover the expenses for our ministry and our television time. Then I move into ministry. Now, I said that to say this. When we receive the offering for our ministry, 
I do not see it at that time. I'm preaching. I'm going to minister to people. They receive the offering. They give it to our staff. And then later on, I'll see the offering or whatever. Here's what boggles my mind. I don't usually know those people. I just got a release here. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I don't know these people. Now, usually, I am such a blessing to the people, and God bless the people so much, then the pastors want me to come back again and again and again, and then it spreads through the region. Then I build a rapport with the people, and then a lot of them becomes partners. But usually, I don't know who gives in the offering. I move out in ministry. And it boggles my mind that I find out that somebody gave something generous, something sacrificial. And then I realize, oh my God, those are the people that God drew me to. I didn't know that. I just feel drawn to minister to this one and that one and that one and spend the most time on them usually. And then I realize later, they touched the heart of God on the offering. But I didn't give them that word because I knew that. I did not know that. I would rather do it that way. I would rather do it that way. But that requires faith. That God's going to supply my need. And that re requires me to have faith in the Jesus and the people that they're going to do the right thing. But a lot of people... They don't get it. They just don't get it. You get it. You get it. I get it. Do you know proof that we get it? How did we survive the things that you've known about? Because we practice what we preach. If you listen to any of my tapes from 40 years ago, I haven't <laughs> changed the thing. I'm still preaching the same mess. I'm like Jesus and Billy Graham. The same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm still preaching. You can get you can get some of these tapes that we did 30 years ago, and you'll hear me saying the same thing then. I just learned more to say now. <laughs> I'll drink to that. With that said, I did tell... On one of the videos, I did tell, I felt led to say that I'm going to be paying a special prayer, prophetic word for people who helped us with the last need. I felt led to say that. So I'm going to keep my word. Because they really touched the heart of God and me. What we went through with the false allegations what we went through with the other false allegations, what we went through with the house, that was very terrible and stressful. And everybody who heard my heart and cared about it touched my heart. It's called compassion. It's called compassion. Marjorie, you are one of them. And I'll say this one more. Marjorie's in Tennessee now. Marjorie and Joseph used to come to our services. They used to live in Lakeland. They came to me one day. Joseph was very upset. He was falsely accused of being doing something terrible. My heart immediately felt his pain. We became very close through that. And we prayed through it. Joseph got the victory. Joseph's in heaven now. Marjorie's in Tennessee. Living next door. I think you live next door to your son or your family right now. That's wonderful. I'm glad for you. You have the most beautiful handwriting. I love when you send notes like that. I wish I could write that nice, but I don't have the patience. I just write like a doctor. I, sometimes I have to ask somebody what my notes say. Marjorie, yeah, we're proud of you. 
And you, when I got falsely accused, ah, it was painful. And Marjorie, because I knew that you could relate and have compassion, you were the one, the first people I told about it. And you prayed us through, ha, ah, could make me cry. It was painful. When they came and accused me, it was so painful. I got a heart attack, quadruple by open heart surgery. I, w I was very upset about it. Marjorie, thank you for your prayers. Uh, I do have some things that I want to say here, but l let me mention a few more. Lisa and Georgia, I want you all, I feel very emotional right now. Ah, uh, because uh, you guys are special. Oh, how, what would we do with our partners? I read someplace that somebody said, someday we'll meet these somebodies. Somebody said, if a man dies, ah, having one good friend, he could die feeling like he's a success. Well, I have so many. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. When Jezebel tries to beat me up, I feel like I don't deserve such good friends. Well, I'm thinking about your people and you're making me emotional. Lisa, Georgia, Charles, your husband. I think your daughter's name is Trish or something. But she's precious. Uh, Lisa in August, around the 19th of August fell off of a, the ladder collapsed. And she fell. Broke her spine, her, uh, uh, what do you call that? The spine? No, I, I'm seeing it in a vision. A pelvis on both sides, broke a pelvis on both sides. In addition to breaking four ribs on one side and another rib on the other side. She's in a wheelchair. Lisa, <laughs> you're coming out of that wheelchair. Because God's got a job for you. Let me calm down. You were a better witness than me about that. I had a little back surgery, $100,000 back surgery. It was almost the pre-surgery, the surgery, and the post-surgery. It's almost $100,000. And now I don't know how much the next surgery is going to be, but thank God I have good insurance. But when they did that back surgery on me, Lisa, it was not fun. His uh, Patty here just had her neck surgery. It was not fun, was it? To shake on her head, no. It was not fun. But you never complained once. You never complained once. Ah. You said, I'm on the way to the doctor, more x ray. They said this, they said that. I'm watching you. You've been a very good witness. I know you've had to be in agony with a broken pelvis on both sides and broken ribs, and you're in a wheelchair. But I want to tell you, you're coming out of that wheelchair because God showed me he's got something for you. First of all, there's new transportation coming to the, to the family. I don't know if it's with the daughter or you guys or what. I don't know what your vehicles you have, but I see new some kind of new transportation coming to the family. But uh, I feel bad for you and what you've gone through. But guess who else I feel bad for? Your daughter and your husband. Because they're going through this with you. It was very hard for Jennifer met with me. And the nurses kind of keep coming to the house for a while, checking on me and draining and, and changing bandages and all. It's also hard for the family. So family, 
expect blessings. But I do see some kind of new transportation and I, my heart goes out to the family. God's going to bless your whole family. It's not going to divide the family because it's very painful. Not only for, when you know when somebody's sick, it affects the whole family. So I'm praying for your family too. And I'm trying to get to what I want to say. You're coming out of the will. Everybody that's watching, be in agreement for Lisa from Georgia. You're coming out of that wheelchair. And here's a job that me and God's going to give you. I'll give you my job first. On my YouTube channel, I have a series of videos called Things to Consider Before You Vote. I want you to start sharing it with people because God's going to use you and your family for the coming election. I see it. Uh, you have a heartbeat and a righteous indignation of what you see going on in the world and the country, and you understand. If you guys are sending cash apps, keep doing it, or PayPal's. In fact, being that people are doing that, Put on the screen, cash app address, PayPal address. But I see you, uh, you guys have an understanding about the importance of voting and what's going on in this country right now is a result of people voting improperly. I'm going to be doing some teachings on the separation of church and state, and uh, a lot of pastors are going to find out uh, the truth about it. I went through a lot of persecution for preaching that. In fact, I think it was one reason we went through one of the other attacks that we went through that cost us almost 100000 to hire accountants and attorneys to prove we did nothing wrong. I want that money back. But Lisa, I see you guys have a real compassion understanding for the importance of voting. Bible. Conservative, capitalistic, patriotic, conservative. If you are a Christian, the only way you should vote is conservative, capital, not socialist, not liberal, conservative, capitalistic, patriotic, vote Jesus. Vote Jesus. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You cannot endorse, encourage, and vote, receive money for politicians who want to establish laws that are contrary to the word of God and expect God to bless you. Look at the mess the world is in. Look at the wars that's happening right now in Ukraine, Israel, and the Hawks that are coming up to the Middle East against us and the rising up of people protesting and rooting for the terrorist politicians, students, professors. Rooting for the terrorists who rape women, cut babies' heads off and burn them alive. And you want to vote for that? And people who endorse that? And late-term abortion? And socialism, where you're encouraging people to put their trust in man and open borders? Where are the terror? They're in this country now. We need to keep our eyes open. And then you want God to bless you? Oh, well, we don't get involved in politics. Well, you're part of the problem. And how many churches and preachers receive money for them kind of politicians? 
backed by Opfa and other people like that? I'm going to pick this up on part two because I don't want to go longer than we are right now. Make sure you watch part two. We're going to call this whatever you want. We'll think of it. But I'm basically, I don't know what I'm, what I'm call it, but Lisa, expect blessing. You are, God's going to put a fire under you and your loved ones, and you're going to raise up a crew. You're going to go, you're going to go knocking knock, door to door, out of a wheelchair, encouraging people to vote conservatively. Mark my words. And because you had a compassion for us, I'm praying God gives you a debt-free home. And God's going to bless your family for the compassion that you had for what I was going through, what we were going through, while you were in a wheelchair having surgeries, surgeries, more surgeries. You're coming out of that wheelchair. We love you. But let me pray for a couple more. Ellie, while you're still here, Ellie's listening on the phone as we do this. Do not worry about your grandson. Benji, and I believe that Benji and his mom will, I want to say uh, the father too, but I believe they're going to be visiting you in Florida at Christmas time. He's going to be just okay. And not just okay, even your daughter. Because you, and you brought her to our church when she was a child. Now she's a mommy. She used to dance with the ballet and all of that. Cute girl. Now she's a mommy. I think that they're in Missouri now, the show me state. They are going to visit you at Christmas time. You sowed seed into Hannah and a lot of seed into Benji because you, of Chris and Hannah and your other son who lived with me. What's, James. What is it? James. James. James lived with me for a while. I threw him out of my van. He did. He was having so much trouble. Your mother said, go live with Pastor John for a while. So he lived with me on the lake house. And I was taking him and his friend to the store to eat. And he said, F you. And I said, F you right out of this car. I threw him right out of the van. <laughs> I, did. I did. I don't know what he got. A, a, he had an attitude. He said, F you to me. And I stopped the van. I said, get out, walk. He did walk 10 miles and then apologize. So, but we do love James. I took him fishing when he was a kid. A lot of times. I will tell this story. I have it on video. And we had a trail of, a trail, Melissa, of alligators. It was like the jungle. Boom, 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 boom. And alligators were following us all over the lake. We, they were always there. But if you turn around, you would see a processional of convoy of alligators flying, following us. And I would say, why are all these alligators following us? And uh, I found out that uh, James was throwing the dead bait overboard. And the alligators were following us all over the lake. And then I found out what James, I caught him doing it. He was only about 10 years old or so at the time. And uh, he thought it was real funny. And I said to him, James, that's not real funny. We're trying to do fishing programs here, and you're throwing the dead man, the alligator. Every time we can't throw the bait out there, alligators were getting it before a fish could get it. And he thought it was funny. And I took my hat off, my fedora, and I wiped my brow. And Charles said to me, you look better with your hat on. And I said, you're going to look better with your face off. I did. I knew how to handle them, kids. James, well, we do love James. He turned out to be a fine young man. Chris, we're praying for. 
keep him where he is. And and Hannah, I think it's in Montana, Hannah. And uh, but they're going to be with you at Christmas time. Somehow you're going to have a, you're going to have the best Christmas you've had, Ellie. I hear the Lord saying, He saw you, heard your prayers, and saw your tears. You're going to have a great Christmas year. And for our viewers, let me tell you about Ellie. She has a tree business. If you need any tree work in Central Florida, call. It doesn't matter. Where there's a storm, there's Ellie. She, she's a storm chaser in the tree business. But if you're in Central Florida and need tree work, let me know. And we'll put you with Ellie. But Ellie came into our service for the first time in 1995. We never knew her before. Never met her. She was sitting halfway back in the congregation. I was preaching. The Lord led me to walk over and lay hands on her and pray for her and the dog. I didn't know the dog was dying, and I didn't know Ellie had cancer. Ellie came in that service with cancer. That was 1995, and she was cancer-free. So, Ellie, you're a faithful partner for all these years. We love you. We are going to pick this up on Partners Prayer and Update Part 2. Make sure you watch Part 2. But I want to say this before it gets away on me. Make sure you come and be with us 2.30, Sunday, December the 10th. We're going to ordain one of our very faithful members named Darlene. She's already been ordained with our ministry and a ministry of helps. She has a feeding ministry, helps the homeless, and we're going to lay hands on her and ordain her in her five-fold ministry gift. We're going to do that 2.30 Sunday, December the 10th. Somebody's knee, somebody's left knee is being healed right now. Thank you, Jesus. We're also going to be praying over people in the gifts of the Spirit, and it's going to be light, bright, and tight. We're going to have uh, some snacks, pizza, fellowship, nothing fancy. Nothing fancy. If you want to, I want you to ask for pizza. We know much how much pizza to have, or lemonade, or iced tea. So RSVP. But it's at the Quality Inn on Lee Road, intersection of I-4. RSVP. So we can be prepared. The motto of the wise, be prepared for surprise. Prior planning prevents poor presentation. In the military, they had another P in there. Prior planning prevents poor presentation. RSVP. We're going to fellowship. Some of you have been watching the videos. You live in driving distance. No excuse. If you go to another church, go to the early morning service, and you can still be with us at 2.30 service. We're here every Sunday, 2.30, every Friday at 7.30, on 7.30 and Friday, 2.30 on Sundays. I want you to come. The word alive is worth the drive. One word from God can change your life for the better forever. One word from God can change your life for the better forever. So come. If you want to bring something only in sealed packages, cookies, something that's sealed, not open, not cooked. If you bring a pot roast, you're going to be leaving with pot roast. Nothing, not that we don't want pot luck. <laughs> we want blessings. We don't want no surprises. And it just, it's just K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simple, Saint. All right, we're going to do part two here.